just in the nick of time, I'm uh, very pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Tom Cutterin, who is a uh, lecturer in United States History at the University of Birmingham, and today he's going to be speaking us, to us about uh, the labour of bourgeois sexuality in the age of revolutions. Thank you. Hi, thanks very much. Um, okay, so I'm Tom Cutterin, I'm not a historian of sexuality, and that's basically why I'm here, because I want you guys' help. <laughs> um, I'm actually a historian of the United States, I'm a historian of the American Revolution. Am I allowed to plug the book? My book's coming out. Fourth of July 2017, Princeton University Press, Gentlemen Revolutionaries, Power and Justice in the New American Republic. So I'm gonna give you some kind of idea, like my work comes out of doing political history, political and social history of the late 18th century United States. Um, the project that this paper kind of comes out of is what I call Project 1.5 because it's, because it's not proper, you see, because it's a biography. Uh, it's a biography of a woman called Angelica Schuyler Church. You might know her if you know anything about this Broadway musical thing called Hamilton. Uh, there's three Schuyler sisters. Hamilton marries one of them. She's called Elizabeth. But the elder one's called Angelica, and that's who I'm writing about. And she had a much more interesting life than Elizabeth Schuyler. Um, because she married an Englishman, John Barker Church, although at the time of marriage he wasn't going by that name, he was going by a pseudonym John Carter because he was fleeing debts in London. Um, in the American Revolutionary War, after these people married, and Jennifer Skyler was well connected and he helped, she helped John basically make loads of money in the American Revolutionary War. Uh, they came back to Europe in the mid-1780s and kind of entered society in London, mainly, a bit in Paris, in the kind of uh, middle of the ferment of the age of revolutions in the 1780s and 90s. Um, she went back to New York in 1797. She had a couple of trips while in America. She had a couple of unaccompanied trips I'll talk about a little bit in this paper. Um, but what I'm interested in, as, a, as an Americanist, I'm interested in this American woman in London and her networks and how her, how her life worked. Um, and thinking about trying to do this project, one of the things I've had to, I've been forced to contemplate for the first time in my life is, uh, you know, female sexuality. And, you know, just... <laughs> <laughs> first time. Um, so that's something I've been trying to think about and trying to put together in, in very sort of loose ways. Uh, so, like I say, I love... I love it. I'm going, to, I'm going to read properly like a normal person, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on where I should be looking and how I can be thinking about this, this person and her life and connecting that to some kind of uh, body of scholarship that, that you guys might know about that I don't. Okay, so. In 1785, John Church bought two houses. One was the townhouse on Sackville Street, where he would spend most of the next decade. The other was Down Place, a villa near Windsor whose lawn ended on the banks of the Thames. Down Place was not a home to live in, it was a place to entertain. Money but scarcely well connected on this side of the Atlantic, John and Angelic Church mounted a campaign to establish themselves on the social and political scene. In the first five years that the churches were in England, ambassadors, financiers, politicians and princes passed through their doors. John's ready pocketbook and head for cards helped him ingratiate himself with some of Britain's leading Whigs in the all-male environment of Brooks's Club. But at Sackville Street and Down Place, as well as in their box at Drury Lane and at social events to which they were invited, Angelica's role was at least as important. Five years later, one woman, a merchant's wife, probably an American merchant's wife, told the American envoy, Gouna Morris, that Mrs. Church, in her efforts to get into high life, neglects her old friends. Three months after that, John Church was elected to Parliament. The church's efforts to get into high life were evidently successful. To put it simply, the task of social networking was to identify the right people and attract their friendship. Like many elite women, Angelica Church had practically been bred for the role. Long before she reached London, acquaintances had begun to comment on her social abilities. Mrs. Carter, because John Church went by Carter in America, is a fine woman, one friend reported to her sister's husband, Alexander Hamilton, in 1783. She charms in all companies. No one has seen her of either sex who has not been pleased with her, and she has pleased everyone. Years later, Hamilton himself remarked to her, 
amiable Angelica exclamation mark, how much you are formed to endear yourself to every good heart. The ability to charm in all companies, to endear oneself to everyone, was a valuable skill. By creating the right atmosphere around herself, whether at home or in public, a woman like Church could become a pole of social attraction, a central node in, a, in an expanding network of friends and admirers. To do this well required uh, the firm control of both the body and the emotions. It was a burden of labour that began long before any given social interaction and continued long afterwards. One element of that labour is what sociologists now call beauty work. 18th century ladies knew it as their toilet. This included the preparation of clothing, hair and makeup, as well as bathing and other practices related to hygiene and scent. It was not work done alone. Rather, it involved, for elite women anyway, rather, it involved an array of paid labour performed by domestic servants, seamstresses, milliners, hairdressers, and so on. Yet it would be wrong to assume that the elite woman at the centre of all this effort was not also at work. It was she who managed the others, decided how she should look, and put herself through the elaborate process of attaining her desired appearance. As in so much else, her choices were guided by social norms and fashions that could shift in multiple rhythms. Staying abreast of such shifts was another facet of women's ongoing beauty work. Nor was the work of any given occasion finished once she was dressed and made up, for she also had to practice a race of movement and deportment, and sometimes, of course, she had to dance. Moreover, when it came to being charming, physical self-presentation was only one aspect of the performance, and I'm basically not going to talk about physical physical stuff anymore. Creating a feeling of intimacy and connection with a friend or acquaintance required a form of communication that was both physical and verbal. It required women to speak and listen in the right way, and if the performance was to be successful, it required them to feel a certain way as well. Evidence for how women and men created such connections can be hard to come by, but it isn't altogether missing. One way, um, one way in for the historian is through the forms of language preserved in women's letters. Two letters received by Angelica Church in the 1780s help reveal the possibilities of intimate and emotive language between men and women. Though it is rare for them to have survived, these playful, ardent, improper letters serve as fossil-like exemplars of a set of behaviours, words, gestures and implications that mark the daily experience, I hypothesise, of women like Church. They open a window on the lost world of 18th century flirtation. So one of Church's gentleman admirers was Francesco de Geno, the London emissary of the Italian city-state Genoa. Born in 1728, de Geno was nearly 60 when he met the 29-year-old Church shortly after her arrival in London with John. Within months, he sent her a letter steeped in innuendo. Dated 26 November 1785, it begins with an apology for not being able to join the churches at Down Place. De Geno went on. I'm not going to try the Italian accent, sorry. Besides, as I think myself more amiable than you, if I should disp uh, disperse too often with my favours towards you, it would raise your pretensions and I should be obliged to hear your sauciness. If about the end of next week you could be disposed to try mine uh, and would condescend to let me know something of the matter, I could manage the business to procure you a compensation for the very great loss you are at present to endure. It would be more perfect then to look at the moon in the fuller shape and to see the planets, the stars and all the celestial devils observed by the terrestrial. If I shall be gratified with the observation, I long for, and it will fall to my lot, to discover some new constellation or heavenly body. It shall be baptised by me and called Angelica's Nails, and they will shine more than upon your hands, near the hair of Berenice or the foot of Cassiopeia. Here, the Jano teased Church for her sauciness, that is, her provocative willingness to address him as an equal. He exaggerated the very great loss she would have to endure by being deprived of his company. Ironically upturning cosmology with his reference to the celestial devils, he could then make an analogy that implied that he and Church were devils themselves. Dublantandre of heavenly body skewed his reference to Church's nails and hands towards rivalry. Indeed, this letter was so playful and overwrought that it's hard to imagine it was meant or received with gravity. But de Jano was a well-connected gentleman who could help further Church's husband's interest in business and politics. Whether or not his tone made her uncomfortable, she had to bear that fact in mind and control her emotions and behaviour accordingly. It may have been easy to do so in response to a letter, but more difficult when the same language was deployed in situations of physical proximity. In the summer of 1789, 
Church travelled without her husband across the Atlantic to visit her family in New York, including her sister Elizabeth and brother-in-law Alexander Hamilton. Among those, among those she met or grew reacquainted with on that visit was the Prussian-born General Friedrich von Steuben, a good friend of both Hamilton and George Washington. Steuben apparently paid close attention to the unaccompanied and amiable Mrs. Church during her time in the United States. When she left, he wrote her a letter so over the top and romantic in propriety that it could hardly have been thought to be sincere. Amiable and dearest friend, Steuben began in Italian before switching to French for the rest of the letter. If your husband is in the least jealous, do not show him this letter. <laughs> but were he as jealous as Othello, I would not know how to hide the tender feelings you have inspired in me. Yes, madam, I love you and I love you seriously. And in that there is nothing extraordinary. For a young man like me, is very easily captivated by a woman as lovable as you are. This letter was considerably more explicit and even more over the top than the one from the jailer. The ageing general invoked for church the bedroom he was sitting in, lit by a single candle in the middle of the night. If my dressing gown were not so dirty, he wrote, I would share a fair resemblance with a vestal virgin. What do you say to that? <laughs> he also hinted at past affairs. Up until now, I have only loved wayward women, capricious ones, and the more devilish a woman was, the more easily I, was, I would be captivated by her. But Church herself, he went on, was unlike those others. Deprived of all these good qualities that make me crazy, you who are the incarnation of sweetness, of kindness, and of goodness itself, how did you manage to inspire these tender sentiments in me? Recollecting that she had not given him a farewell kiss when she departed, Stoyman ended his letter on a note of desperate romantic passion. Good night. Good night, my dear friend, he wrote, oh, exclamation mark, this farewell kiss, good night. Neither de Geno nor Steuben was necessarily typical of the gentleman with whom Church socialised. Both were ageing bachelors with continental European backgrounds. It has been suggested that Steuben, for one, was homosexual. All this apparently gave them licence to address Church in writing in such overtly sexual and intimate terms. As Claude Anne Lopez has written of a similarly ageing and cosmopolitan Benjamin Franklin, the tone of these letters was somewhat risque, somewhat avuncular, taking a bold step forwards and an ironic step backwards. But we need not treat such letters as serious in order to find in them evidence of how men treated women like church. They, these letters pastiche a language and an attitude that really existed. That's my suggestion. While few men could write to women in such a way, at least without taking steps to make their letters genuinely clandestine, which these ones obviously were not, the way they spoke and behaved in person could be much less subject to restraint. Take Thomas Rowlandson's contemporary depictions of the heterosocial milieu at Vauxhall Gardens and Drury Lane, which I'm going to show you later, in which respectably dressed men leer over, fashionably, over fashionable women, whispering in their ears. Such spaces were the factory floor of sexual and emotional labour. While they empowered women in new ways, they also facilitated new forms of gendered exploitation. Church's letters from Dodono and Steuben suggest the kind of flirtatious exchange she might have had with other men. In her letters to Thomas Jefferson, we can hear Church's voice itself. The two first met in Paris, where their daughters were at school together in the winter of 1787-88. to The morning you left us all was wrong, Jefferson wrote to Church that February. Even the sunshine was provoking, with which I never quarrelled before. This sentimental opening began an exchange that lasted sporadically for almost a decade. When the artist John Trumbull painted Jefferson, he made three copies. One was for Maria Cosway, a mutual friend, and another was for Church, and the third was for his daughter. Mrs Cosway's is a better likeness than mine, she told him, Church told him, but then I have a better elsewhere, and so I console myself. Her memory of him was stronger and more accurate than Trumbull's painting. In a later letter, Church wrote, I hope you will sometimes think of me with affection, because I wish it. Is that a good reason? This intimate, teasing language was marked with an ironic self-consciousness, echoing Jefferson's own reflexive performance of fashionable sensibility. She was just as deaf a flirt as he was. Both participants had the power to shape the tone of their correspondence and their friendship. Elite women like Angelica Church in the final decades of the 18th century were active participants in the many-layered process of constructing and maintaining personal relationships and therefore social networks. This process exacted from them a toll of emotional and sexual labour. Through the way they appeared, how they moved and what they said, women could mobilise emotional and sexual capacities to help achieve their social aims. 
They did so within broadly understood cultural patterns that were open to pastiche and critique. Indeed, there was a deep tension in the way emotion and sexuality could sometimes grant women power within a society and culture that remained dominated by men. Yeah, Rowlandson's painting of Vauxhall Gardens, of which this is a uh, detail, captures an ambivalence about gendered power that becomes satirical in the context of patriarchy. It suggests that the relative novelty of heterosociability might have unnerving consequences, placing women at the centre of attention and transforming men into mere multitudes. Right? All these men are basically exactly the same. Right? 18th century culture struggled with this tension, even as women grew in number as cultural producers and consumers. For patriarchal culture at large, women's influence presented a complicated problem. For someone like the upwardly mobile John Barker Church, her husband, it could be a field of opportunity. That's kind of where we leave church a little bit and move to more general other sources of information. As women's presence in I'll leave that though. As women's presence in society became increasingly normal during the 18th century, there was no shortage of men eager to advise them how they should behave. At the core of this advice was the notion that women's function was to gratify men. In 1759, a poet called Thomas Marriott published his female conduct being an essay on the art of pleasing, which rendered the subject in two books of heroic couplets. Conduct literature such as John Gregory's A Father's Legacy to His Daughters, first published in 1774, sought to initiate girls into the great art of pleasing. Reverend John Bennett's 1789 Letters to a Young Lady were addressed to an idealised female reader, one who, quote, has a wish only to please. Through such literature, 18th century women were indoctrinated with the art of pleasing. At the same time, they could expect such lessons to be passed on in more mundane ways through their parents, nurses and teachers, through the conversation of their peers, and through their observation of the world. <coughs> While the ideals of gendered social conduct put forward by advice writers were rarely reflected perfectly in real life, they nonetheless helped to shape everyday assumptions about proper behaviour. To be pleasing meant first and foremost conducting oneself according to the desires of others, namely men. Women who had learned the art of pleasing were submissive, mild and deferential. Amiable was the word often used. You might remember Angel uh, Alexander Hamilton refers to Angelica as amiable Angelica. Moreover, their behaviour had to seem natural, not forced. Conduct authors made distinctions between real and fake, or studied manners. As John Bennett explained, <coughs> Louisa charms every person because she is always amiable and obliging, without studying to charm. Politeness, he wrote, should not be dissimulation. Rather, it should stem from, quote, a real desire of pleading. In other words, such authors noticed that their advice had been effective. Women had indeed been studying the art of pleasing and managing their behaviour appropriately. The problem was that if their efforts became visible, they could seem manipulative or insincere. To achieve the desired effect, women had to manage themselves so as not only to be pleasing, but to appear naturally so. This was an emotional demand. Women who sought to be truly amiable had to change their very nature, to cultivate within themselves, quote, a real desire of pleasing. Writers like Thomas Marriott recognised that women exercised agency and even held power over men. At the same time, their rhetoric worked, the writer's rhetoric worked to frame women's power in such a way that in practice it supported patriarchal authority. Every wife her husband must obey, this is the heroic couple guy, every wife her husband must obey, he wrote, she, by compliance, can her ruler sway. Which doesn't make any sense. <laughs> a woman could only exercise power, Marriott insisted, by submitting to her male superior. By yielding, she conquers, and by serving, reigns. Yet this emphasis on women's formal relationships of domination by men opened up fertile ground for new anxieties about female autonomy. There was, by the 18th century, one particular moment in an elite woman's life when she appeared to hold all the cards, the time between achieving adulthood and accepting a husband. Love and courtship, it is universally allowed, invest a young lady with more authority than in any other situation falls to the lot of human beings. Or so the New York Magazine hyperbolically declared in 1795. Once she was being courted, a woman could, quote, mould the taste, the manners, the conduct of her admirers, according to her pleasure. 
English authors agreed. The power of a fine woman over the hearts of men, of men of the finest parts, wrote John Gregory, is even beyond what she can conceive. This moment of female empowerment, in all its complexity and contradictions, was embodied in the popular literary figure of the coquette. The coquette was a woman who reveled in the temporary freedom of her unmarried adult state, who prolonged and expanded it as much as she could, and who thus combined the art of pleasing with a complementary ability to tease and frustrate her would-be suitors. Quote, teasing and tormenting is the sustenance, the breath, the very life of most young women uh, who are sure of the affection of their lovers wrote the anonymous wit who penned an essay on the art of ingeniously tormenting in 1757. As Eliza Haywood recorded in her Female Spectator a few years earlier, there was then a vogue among women for, quote, attracting as great a number of lovers as possible and giving an equal share of encouragement to all. Coquettes extended their freedom by delaying the choice that would eventually transform them into suppliant wives. But that window of choice remained open only while a woman could attract multiple suitors. Hence a coquette, as defined by the Dictionary of Love in 1753, was one whose chief aim is to be thought agreeable, handsome, amiable. She was adept in the arts of pleasing and of teasing. Coquettes rapidly became, coquettes rapidly became an ubiquitous figure in the 18th century popular culture. Novelists such as Eliza Hayward and Charlotte Lennox Quote, treated the time between a young woman's coming out and her marriage as the most important period in her life. Uh, that's from Catherine Green's scholarly monograph, The Courtship Novel. As literary historian Teresa Braunschneider argues, the fictional coquette began her career early in the 18th century as a curious embodiment of the new possibilities that social and cultural shifts opened up for women. In particular, uh, Braunschneider writes, the coquette character of this period exercised choice in ways only newly available to large <coughs> numbers of women in Britain in the early 18th century. Yet by the second half of the century, quote, coquetry was generally treated with a less indulgent and optimistic. <coughs> Literary rep representation registered the challenge such women could pose to patriarchal order. By the end of the century, coquette stories were more often than not tragedies. Rather than celebrating the expansion of women's agency, they served as warnings of how dangerous freedom of choice could be. Hannah Foster's 1795 American novel, The Coquette, seems to represent the culmination of this journey. While such tragedies might condemn society as much as they condemn the heroines themselves, the message for The Coquette was no longer an optimistic one. And this is obviously the period in which Angelica lives. This downward trajectory for the figure of The Coquette mirrored the rise of a new domestic feminine ideal, which sought to restore the separation of male and female spheres that had been eroded in the 18th century. As we have already noted, oh, well, I'm not sure we have. That might, be from a, uh, that might be from an earlier version of this. Anyway, the, uh, this renewed culture of female domesticity uh, advanced more quickly in the new United States than it did on the other side of the Atlantic. The rhetoric of republicanism, partly rooted in a classical imaginary in which women were completely excluded from public life, furnished new arguments for women's domestication as wives and mothers. Flirts and fops, coxcombs and coquettes romp through the pages of Republican literature with abandon, historian Jan Lewis has written, serving as a distillation of what the age most feared. In Britain too, a new domesticated masculinity and its feminine counterpart had emerged by the 1790s as a challenge to the more public sociability of earlier in the century. Decency, propriety and modesty began to be touted as the true measures of a gentleman's character. Yet the rise of this domesticating discourse did not indicate a wholesale change in social norms. Rather, it signalled the persistence of what it decried, patterns of behaviour that would continue into the 19th century. Coquetry's most perceptive critic was no advocate of female domesticity. In her two tracts, A Vindication of the Rights of Man and A Vindication of the Rights of Women, Mary Wollstonecraft lamented what she saw as the damage done to the female psyche by the 18th century's gendered social conventions. The art of pleasing, which found advocates throughout the century, represented for Wollstonecraft an ideology of masculine domination that not only demeaned women, but denied their essential equality as human beings. How grossly do they insult us, she wrote, who thus advise us only to render ourselves gentle domestic brutes. For instance, the winning softness so warmly and frequently recommended that governs by obeying, how insignificant is the being, can it be an immortal one, who will condescend to govern by such sinister methods? Whatever power a woman gained from her ability to please men, Wollstonecraft saw, 
it would always also work in the opposite direction, strengthening men's power over women. Men are not aware, she wrote, of the misery they cause and the vicious weakness they cherish by only inciting women to render themselves pleasing. Wollstonecraft made clear that not only was the culture of coquetry deeply tied up with the art of pleasing, but it permeated women's behaviour beyond the temporary period of courtship. Married women could be coquettes too. As she wrote in A Vindication of the Rights of Man, I do not intend to be sarcastically paradoxical when I say that women of fashion take husbands that they may have it in their power to coquette, the grand business of genteel life, with a number of admirers, and thus flutter the spring of life away without laying up any store of the, for the winter of age, or being of any use to society. And we express surprise that adulteries are so common. A woman never forgets to adorn herself, to make an impression on the senses of the other sex, and to extort the homage it is gallant to pay, and yet we wonder that they have such confined understandings. Wollstonecraft's allusion to adultery had plenty of basis in fact. The scandalous divorce proceedings of Sir Richard and Lady Seymour Worsley in 1782 seemed to reveal the sexual depravity of British high society in the years immediately before John and Angelica Church arrived in London. The social circle they entered, which included the Whig parliamentary leader Charles James Fox, was notorious for circulating mistresses. As their friend Richard Sheridan had noted in his 1777 play The School for Scandal, fashion required that a lady keep a lover. I mean, he may not have been noting that in all seriousness, but... The churches did not shy away from associating with known libertines. According to a, a recollection in Gouverneur Morris's diary in 1790, there had been a falling out between Angelica and one of her friends among the more stiff-mannered American expatriate community. Mrs. Church, her friend suspected, had taken offence at an expression of regret that she was so intimate with Mrs. Cosway, whose house is considered as one of those where, from the very mixed companies which frequent it, dangerous connections may be formed. Such comments highlighted the emerging tension between <coughs> idealised domesticity and the 18th century's norm of heterosociability, a contest in which Wollstonecraft saw faults on both sides. Because women were trained to please, she wrote in A Vindication of the Rights of Women, uh, they would inevitably look for ways to practice their art and receive gratification for it. The woman who has only been taught to please will soon find that her charms are oblique sunbeams, and that they cannot have much effect on her husband's heart when they are seen every day. Is it not more rational to expect that she will try to please other men, and in the emotions raised by the expectation of new conquests, endeavour to forget the mortification her love or pride has received? This did not necessarily mean adultery. Indeed, the figure of the coquette created a model of emotional and sexual connection that, for the most part, precluded sex itself. As Brownschneider points out, a coquette was technically virtuous because chaste, even while she appeared promiscuous with her affections. Back in 1714, the spectator had warned that a coquette often loses her reputation whilst she preserves her virtue. Coquetry gave unmarried women a novel kind of freedom and even power, without exposing them to all the dire social consequences of premarital sex. Likewise, married women could continue to act like coquettes, staying faithful to their husbands, while sharing affection and intimacy with a wider circle of admirers. Rather than being a slippery slope towards adultery, the forms and rituals of coquetry could help to create useful barriers. It was, after all, an art of teasing and frustrating, as well as of pleasing. Though it arose as the result of new patterns of companionate marriage, which gave unmarried women power to negotiate with their potential husbands, coquetry went on to shape social relations within marriage too, creating a new balance of sexual power that promoted the formation of heterosocial bonds. Participation in the culture of coquetry required women to transform themselves physically and emotionally, bending to male tastes and desires so as to become objects of attraction. But at the same time, they exercised a certain power of restraint over their male admirers. It could be this very quality of restraint that excited men's passion and affection, as Friedrich von Steuben parodically demonstrated when Angelica Church refused him that farewell kiss. The emotional and sexual labour inherent in the art of pleasing was not only a duty inculcated in 18th century women. Whatever, Wollstonecraft said, to be an amiable woman was not merely to become the toy of man. For someone like Church, it was also the key to participation in genteel life, a potential route to love and marriage, and a weapon that could be employed to many ends. We come to the end now. As Jürgen Hagmas 
first argued over 50 years ago. The 18th century witnessed the formation in Western Europe and European North America of a bourgeois public sphere, a space between the state on the one hand and the private household on the other, in which the independent interests of an emerging commercial bourgeois class could be collectively envisioned and promoted. This public sphere was carved out in both intellectual space, through printed culture, especially newspapers, but also the novel, and physical space, coffee houses, salons, parlours and assemblies. What Habermas did not stress was that many of these spaces were populated by women as well as men. Women were readers and writers, guests and hostesses, dancing partners and conversationalists. At least in Britain, this female presence in public was not a continuation of courtly practices, but a novelty that soon became a point of urgent interest in the era's intellectual and cultural productions. It would not last long into the 19th century. In fact, the high point of heterosociability, by which I mean men mixing with women, I should have mentioned that earlier, sorry, and the heyday of coquetry were coterminous <clears throat> with a century-long process of forming the bourgeois public sphere. That's kind of the core uh, correlation that I want my argument to explain, right? Uh, heyday of coquetry, coterminous with the process of forming the bourgeois public sphere. Moreover, women were not merely present at this creation, they took part in it. Although the British aristocracy uh, was hardly divorced from the world of commerce, bourgeois society functioned distinctively and, as a result, took on a distinct structural character. Whereas aristocracy relied on reproducing uh, hierarchical power vertically across the generations through inheritance, bourgeois society was defined by its networks, relying on the reproduction of capital through circuits of extraction, production, trade and finance. Horizontal relationships, not vertical ones, were the key to these circuits. The planter, merchant and financier each expected mutual enrichment and they owed each other mutual respect. New contacts entering a network promised influxes of credit, capital and knowledge. The better and more extensive a man's connections, the better off he could expect to become. But how could he come by these connections? That's where sociability and women came in. In the 18th century's new heterosocial spaces, elite women's emotional and sexual labour helped create bonds between private individuals, weaving together the social networks that would constitute the fabric of bourgeois society. The cultural practices and expectations associated with the rise of mixed company worked to facilitate and encourage this process of network formation. They evolved to do so as, over time, practices that strengthened such networks were continued and those that weakened them were gradually jettisoned. Changes in language, etiquette, and social morality must be considered in the context of this emerging social formation. While the underlying strength of the bourgeoisie lay in its position as the agent of com commerce and capital, the pattern of its emergence was also determined by the social structures and techniques it produced. The newfound power of women as coquettes, married or unmarried, functioned to both expand and integrate the social networks they belonged to, networks through which information and capital flowed alongside affection. Consider Thomas Rowlandson's 1785 drawing an audience watching a play at Drury Lane Theatre. The title is deliberately ironic, for most of the audience here are not watching the play at all, but each other. The centre of attention in this scene is the group of fashionable women who sit to the right of the middle ground. The total of five women in the picture are surrounded by at least nine men, and for each woman, at least one man has his eyes fixed on her, not the stage. What is depicted here, I suggest, is the formation of a network in which the woman in the blue hat is a central note. The only woman ostensibly watching the play, she is herself watched by the man in green sitting one row in front. The woman to her left blushes in the gaze of the man lounging in red, and the woman to her right leans toward a young man with red lapels. These three men may or may not be friends already, but from different parts of the room, their attention has been focused towards the same central point. The allure of femininity, the product of emotional and sexual labour, has brought them together. In Rodinson's drawing, no two men seem to be competing for the interest of the same woman. Yet such competition was the essence of what made a coquette, a woman who attracted as great a number of lovers as possible. If, for her, coquetry created a space in which to exercise agency while postponing the moment of final choice, for her admirers it offered a similar advantage. Courting a coquette 
allowed a gentleman to show off his fine qualities and burnish his sensibility without putting his own freedom too much at risk. The public rituals of flirtation that emerged with the rise of mixed company, illustrated in Roland's pictures, were opportunities for the competitive performance of masculine virtues. Claire Lyons notes that male boasting about extramarital sexual encounters was common in Philadelphia of the 18th century. I, I have no idea about the 21st century. <laughs> in England, Marilyn Morris informs us, men often built lasting bonds as they assisted one another with the consequences of their transgressions. But even in the absence of outright transgression, the 18th century's metropolitan sexual culture could bring together men in friendly competition. Coquettes played the part of judges in a bloodless pastiche of the feudal chivalric tournament. Women then were not the only ones who performed emotional labour. The type of masculine performances caricatured in the letters of Francesco de Geno and Friedrich von Steuben were also forms of work, regulated by the standards of fashion and civility, just as women's performances were. Men too undertook beauty work that included makeup and dress, as well as the manners of posture and movement. They cultivated forms of expression and feeling. Sentiment was the predominant term of the day, just as women learned the art of pleasing, and they too faced charges of dissimulation or hypocrisy when their emotional performances were deemed insufficiently natural. Through such labour, men not only established hierarchies within bourgeois society, they also policed its limits. The ability to buy clothing that kept up with the fashion, to display the education and intelligence required by sentimental conversation, and to have the leisure to devote to the pursuit of feminine affection, all helped to set limits on belonging. Rather than the blood ties that determine membership of the aristocracy, the makeup of bourgeois society rested primarily on subjective distinctions linked to individual character, mirroring the dynamics of commercial credit. The rituals of sociability including those that centred on women, thus performed two major functions, I suggest. The formation of networks, networks and the judgment of individuals. Over time, however, bourgeois society and capitalist states developed institutions that largely superseded sociability in both fields. By the mid-19th century, banks, insurance companies and other corporations could allocate capital and manage risk without the need for any social connection between parties. Of course, that did not mean personal relationships stopped being important, just as they are in capitalism today. But they ceased to exercise a determining influence on the commercial economy overall. 19th and 20th century capitalism, like 19th and 20th century politics, was organised primarily by institutions that excluded women almost completely. It was only in the 18th century, when bourgeois society and its economic correlate, capitalism, remained in a condition of weakness and transition, that women were temporarily allowed into its central spaces, and that uh, they were able to hold positions of relative power. We must conclude, or I want to conclude, that this was the case because such an arrangement at that moment was crucial to bourgeois society's formation and reproduction. I guess I could make a weaker claim. It was helpful to bourgeois society's formation and reproduction. Elaine Chalice's work on British politics and Frederica Teuter and David Shields' has recently resuscitated ess essays on the Republican court in the early United States have helped to foreground women's role in the social and communicative practices of late 18th century politics. Their findings should be extended to contiguous fields of power, that is, to the fields of commerce and finance, rather than politics where they focus, in both societies, American and British. Andrew Caton recently asked of Toyota and Shields' work, perhaps we might do better to look inside the homes of Astors than Washington. Yet, inasmuch as it suggests a clear divide between the two, the question may be misconceived. The churches moved in equal parts among Astors and Washingtons. Their connections span Parliament and Congress, the Bank of England and the Bank of North America, the commercial houses and drawing rooms of New York, London and Paris. The creation of that network was itself a work of labour undertaken by both husband and wife. By participating in bourgeois society, Angelica helped maintain and strengthen the system within which she and her sex remained subordinate. There is no doubt that she was privileged and even powerful. But that should not obscure the fact that she belonged to what was, in the 18th century, a growing category, that of exploited labourer.